Stafford and I watched them through the slightly open door go into the lift and descend. He gave a curious smile, shut the door, glanced up at the clock on the wall, and sat down in an easy chair to wait. His mind went back to the day, a week ago now, when he and Mary Ann had gone their separate ways from Kennedy Airport. They had stood there, both of them finding it difficult to speak. Stafford and I had broken the silence first. Do you think we'll ever meet again? I wonder. Is there any reason why we shouldn't? Every reason, I should think. She looked at him, then quickly away again. These partings have to happen. It's part of the job. The job? It's always the job with you, isn't it? It has to be. You're a professional. I'm only an amateur. You're a— He broke off. What are you? Who are you? I don't really know, do I? No. He looked at her then. He saw sadness, he thought, in her face, something that was almost pain. So I have to wonder. You think I ought to trust you, I suppose? No, not that. That is one of the things that I have learnt, that life has taught me. There is nobody that one can trust. Remember that, always. So that is your world. A world of distrust, of fear, of danger. I wish to stay alive. I am alive. I know. And I want you to stay alive. I trusted you, in Frankfurt. You took a risk. It was a risk well worth taking. You know that as well as I do. You mean because, because we've been together. And now, that is my flight being called. Is this companionship of ours which started in an airport to end here, in another airport? You're going where? To do what? To do what I have to do. To Baltimore. To Washington. To Texas. To do what I have been told to do. And I? I have been told nothing. I am to go back to London and do what there? Wait. Wait for what? For the advances that almost certainly will be made to you. And what am I to do then? She smiled at him, with the sudden gay smile that he knew so well. Then you play it by ear. You'll know how to do it. None better. You'll like the people who approach you. They'll be well chosen. It's important, very important, that we should know who they are. I must go. Goodbye, Marianne. Auf Wiedersehen. In the London flat, the telephone rang. At a singularly apposite moment, Stafford and I thought, bringing him back from his past memories, just at the moment of their farewell. Auf Wiedersehen, he murmured, as he rose to his feet, crossed to take the receiver off. Let it be so. A voice whose wheezy accents were quite unmistakable. Stafford and I? He gave the requisite answer. No smoke without fire. My doctor says I should give up smoking. Poor fellow, said Colonel Pikeaway. You might as well give up hope of that. Any news? Oh, yes. Thirty pieces of silver. Promised, that is to say. Damned swine. Yes, yes. Keep calm. And what did you say? I played them a tune. Siegfried's horn motif. I was following an elderly aunt's advice. It went down very well. Sounds crazy to me. Do you know a song called Juanita? I must learn that, too, in case I need it. Don't you know who Anita is? I think so. Hmm. I wonder. Heard of in Baltimore last. What about your Greek girl, Daphne Theodophanus? Where is she now, I wonder? Sitting in an airport somewhere in Europe waiting for you, probably, said Colonel Pikeaway. Most of the European airports seem to be closed down because they've been blown up more or less, or damaged. High explosives, hijackers, hijinks. The boys and girls come out to play, the moon doth shine as bright as day. Leave your supper and leave your sleep and shoot your playfellow in the street. The children's crusade a la mode. Not that I really know much about it. I only know the one that Richard Coeur de Lyon went to. But in a way, this whole business is rather like the children's crusade. Starting with idealism, starting with ideas of the Christian world delivering the holy city from pagans and ending in death, death, and again, death. 
Nearly all the children died, or were sold into slavery. This will end the same way, unless we can find some means of getting them out of it. Chapter 20 The Admiral Visits an Old Friend Thought you must all be dead here, said Admiral Blunt with a snort. His remark was addressed not to the kind of butler which he would have liked to see opening this front door, but to the young woman whose surname he could never remember, but whose Christian name was Amy. Rung you up at least four times in the last week. Gone abroad, that's what they said. Uh, we have been abroad. We've only just come back. Matilda oughtn't to go rampaging about abroad, not at her time of life. She'll die of blood pressure, or heart failure, or something in one of those modern aeroplanes. Cavorting about, full of explosives, put in them by the Arabs or the Israelis or somebody or other. Not safe at all any longer. Her doctor recommended it to her. Oh, well, we all know what doctors are. And she has really come back in very good spirits. Oh, where's she been, then? Oh, uh, taking a cure. In Germany, or... Uh, I can never quite remember whether it's Germany or Austria. Uh, that new place, you know, the Golden Gasthaus. Ah, oh, yes. I know the place you mean. Costs the earth, doesn't it? Well, it's said to produce very good results. Probably only a different way of killing you quicker, said Admiral Blunt. How did you enjoy it? Well, not really very much. The scenery was very nice, but... An imperious voice sounded from the floor above. Amy? Amy? What are you doing, talking in the hall all this time? Bring Admiral Blunt up here. I'm waiting for him. Gallivanting about, said Admiral Blunt, after he had greeted his old friend. That's how you'll kill yourself one of these days. You mark my words. No, I shan't. There's no difficulty at all in travelling nowadays. Running about all those airports, ramps, stairs, buses. Not at all. I had a wheelchair. A year or two ago, when I saw you, you said you wouldn't hear of such a thing. You said you have too much pride to admit you needed one. Well, I've had to give up some of my pride nowadays, Philip. Come and sit down here and tell me why you wanted to come and see me, all of a sudden. You've neglected me a great deal for the last year. Well, I've not been so well myself. Besides, I've been looking into a few things. You know the sort of thing. Where they ask your advice, but don't mean in the least to take it. They can't leave the Navy alone. Keep on wanting to fiddle about with it, drat them. You look quite well to me, said Lady Matilda. Well, you don't look so bad yourself, my dear. You've got a nice sparkle in your eye. I'm deafer than when you last saw me. You'll have to speak up more. All right, I'll speak up. Uh, what do you want? Gin and tonic? Or whiskey or rum? Oh, you seem ready to dispense strong liquor of any kind. If it's all the same to you, I'll have a gin and tonic. Amy rose and left the room. And when she brings it, said the Admiral, get rid of her again, will you? I want to talk to you. Talk to you particularly, is what I mean. Refreshment brought, Lady Matilda made a dismissive wave of the hand, and Amy departed, with the air of one who is pleasing herself, not her employer. She was a tactful young woman. Nice girl, said the Admiral. Very nice. Is that why you asked me to get rid of her? And see she shut the door, so that she mightn't overhear you saying something nice about her? No. I wanted to consult you. What about? Your health? Or where to get some new servants? Or what to grow in the garden? I want to consult you very seriously. I thought perhaps you might be able to remember something for me. Dear Philip, how touching that you should think I can remember anything. Every year my memory gets worse. I've come to the conclusion that one only remembers what's called the friends of one's youth. Even horrid girls one was at school with, one remembers, though one doesn't want to. That's where I've been now, as a matter of fact. Oh, where you've been now? Visiting schools? No, no, no. I went to see an old school friend, whom I hadn't seen for thirty, forty, fifty, <laughs> that sort of time. Oh, what was she like? Enormously fat, and even nastier and horrider than I remembered her. <laughs> you've got very queer tastes, I must say, Matilda. Well, go on, tell me. Tell me what it is you want me to remember. I wondered if you remembered another friend of yours. Robert Shoreham. Robbie Shoreham, of course I do. The scientist fellow. Top scientist. Of course. He wasn't the sort of man one would ever forget. I wonder what put him into your head. Public need. Funny you should say that, said Lady Matilda. 
I thought the same thing myself the other day. You thought what? That he was needed, or someone like him. If there is anyone like him, there isn't. Now listen, Matilda. People talk to you a bit. They tell you things. I've told you things myself. I've always wondered why, because you can't believe that I'll understand them or be able to describe them. And that was even more the case with Robbie than with you. I don't tell you naval secrets. Well, he didn't tell me scientific secrets. I mean, only in a very general way. Yes, but he used to talk to you about them, didn't he? Well, he liked saying things that would astonish me sometimes. All right, then. Here it comes. I want to know if he ever talked to you, in the days when he could talk properly, poor devil, about something called Project B. Project B? Matilda Cleckheaton considered thoughtfully. Sounds vaguely familiar, she said. He used to talk about Project This or That sometimes, or Operation This or That, but you must realize that none of it ever made any kind of sense to me. And he knew it didn't. But he used to like, oh, how shall I put it, astonishing me, rather, you know, sort of describing it the way that a conjurer might describe how he takes three rabbits out of a hat without your knowing how he did it. Project B. Yes, that was a good long time ago. He was wildly excited for a bit. I used to say to him sometimes, how's Project B going? I know. I know. You've always been a tactful woman. You could always remember what people were doing or interested in. And even if you don't know the first thing about it, you'd show an interest. I described a new kind of naval gun to you once, and you must have been bored stiff. But you listened as brightly as though it was the thing you'd been waiting to hear about all your life. As you tell me, I've been a tactful woman, and a good listener, even if I've never had much in the way of brains. Well, I want to hear a little more about what Robbie said about Project B. He said... Well, it's very difficult to remember now. He mentioned it after talking about some operation that they used to do on people's brains. You know, the people who were terribly melancholic and who were thinking of suicide and who were so worried and neurasthenic that they had awful anxiety complexes, stuff like that. The sort of thing people used to talk about in connection with Freud. And he said that the side effects were impossible. Uh, I mean, the people were quite happy and meek and docile and didn't worry any more or want to kill themselves, but they, well, uh, I mean, they didn't worry enough and... Uh, Therefore, they used to get run over and all sorts of things like that, because they weren't thinking of any danger and didn't notice it. Oh, I'm putting it badly, but you do understand what I mean. And anyway, he said, that was going to be the trouble, he thought, with Project B. Did he describe it at all more closely than that? Oh, he said I'd put it into his head, said Matilda Cleckheaton unexpectedly. What? Do you mean to say a scientist? A top-flight scientist like Robbie actually said to you that you would put something into his scientific brain. You don't know the first thing about science. Of course not. But I used to try and put a little common sense into people's brains. The cleverer they are, the less common sense they have. I mean, really, the people who matter are the people who thought of simple things, like perforations on postage stamps, or like somebody, Adam, uh, or whatever his name was, uh, no, MacAdam, in America, who put black stuff on roads so the farmers could get all their crops from farms to the coast and make a better profit. I mean, they do much more good than all the high-powered scientists do. Scientists can only think of things for destroying you. Well, that's the sort of thing I said to Robbie. Quite nicely. Of course, as a kind of joke. He'd just been telling me that some splendid things had been done in the scientific world about germ warfare and experiments with biology and what you can do to unborn babies if you get at them early enough and also some peculiarly nasty and very unpleasant gases, and saying how silly people were to protest against nuclear bombs, because they were really a kindness compared to some of the other things that had been invented since then. And so I said it would be much more to the point if Robbie, or someone clever like Robbie, uh, could think of something really sensible. And he looked at me with that, you know, little twinkle he has in his eye sometimes, and said, well, what would you consider sensible? And I said, well, instead of inventing all these germ warfares and these nasty gases and all the rest of it, why don't you just invent something that makes people feel happy? I said, it oughtn't to be any more difficult to do. I said, you've talked about this operation where I think you said they took a bit out of the front of your brain or maybe the back of your brain, but anyway, it made a great difference in people's dispositions. They'd become quite different. They hadn't worried any more or they hadn't wanted to commit suicide. But, I said, well, if you could change people like that, just by taking a little bit of bone or muscle or nerve or tinkering up a gland or taking out a gland or putting in more of a gland, I said, if you can make all that difference in people's dispositions, why can't you invent something that will make people pleasant or just sleepy, perhaps? Suppose you had something 
Not a sleeping draught, but just something that people sat down in a chair and had a nice dream. Twenty-four hours or so. And just woke up to be fed now and again, I said. It would be a much better idea. And, uh, is that what Project B was? Well, of course, he never told me what it was exactly. But he was excited with an idea, and he said I'd put it into his head. So it must have been something rather pleasant I'd put into his head, mustn't it? I mean, I hadn't suggested any ideas to him of any nasty ways for killing people, and I didn't want people even, you know, to cry, like tear gas or anything like that. Perhaps laughing, yes. I believe I mentioned laughing gas. I said, well, if you have your teeth out, they give you three sniffs of it and you laugh. Well, surely, surely you could invent something that's as useful as that, but would last a little longer. "'because I believe laughing gas only lasts about fifty seconds, doesn't it? "'I know my brother had some teeth out once. "'The dentist's chair was very near the window, "'and my brother was laughing so much, while he was unconscious, I mean, "'that he stretched his leg right out and put it through the dentist's window, "'and all the glass fell in the street, and the dentist was very cross about it. "'Your stories always have such strange sidekicks,' said the Admiral. "'Anyway, uh, this is what Robbie Shoreham had chosen to get on with. "'From your advice?' Well, I don't know what it was exactly. I mean, I don't think it was sleeping or laughing. At any rate, it was something. It wasn't really Project B, um, it had another name. What sort of name? Well, he did mention it once, I think, or twice. The name he'd given it, uh, rather like Benger's Food, said Aunt Matilda, considering thoughtfully. Some, uh, soothing agent for the digestion? I don't think it had anything to do with the digestion. I rather think it was something you sniffed, or perhaps it was a gland. You know, we talked of so many things that you never quite knew what he was talking about at the moment. Benjamin's food, Ben, Ben. It, it did begin with Ben, and there was a pleasant word associated with it. Is that all you can remember about it? I think so. I mean, this was just a talk we had once, and then, uh, quite a long time afterwards, he told me I'd put something into his head for Project Ben or something. And after that, occasionally, if I remembered, I'd ask him if he was still working on Project Ben, and then sometimes he'd be very exasperated and say no. He'd come up against a snag, and he was putting it all aside now, because it was in, well, I mean, the next eight words were pure jargon, and I couldn't remember them, and you wouldn't understand them if I said them to you. But in the end, I think, dear, oh dear, this is all about eight or nine years ago, and in the end he came one day and said, do you remember Project Ben? I said, well, of course I remembered it. Are you still working on it? And he said no. He was determined to lay it all aside. I said I was sorry, sorry if he'd given it up, and he said, well, it's not only that I can't get what I was trying for. I know now that it could be got. I know where I went wrong. I know just what the snag was. I know now just how to put that snag right again. I've got Lisa working on it with me. Yes, it could work. It'd require experimenting on certain things, but it could work. Well, I said to him, what are you worrying about? And he said, because I don't know what it would really do to people. Well, I said something about his being afraid it would kill people or maim them for life or something. No, he said, it's not like that. He said, it's a... Oh, of course, now I remember. He called it Project Benvo. Yes, and that's because it had to do with benevolence. Benevolence, said the Admiral, highly surprised. Benevolence? Well, do you mean charity? No, no, no. I think he meant simply that you could make people benevolent. Feel benevolent. Peace and goodwill towards men. Well, he didn't put it like that. No, that's reserved for religious leaders. They preach that to you, and that if you did what they preached, it'd be a very happy world. But Robbie, I gather, was not preaching. He proposed to do something in his laboratory to bring about this result by purely physical means. That's the sort of thing. And he said you can never tell when things are beneficial to people, or when they're not. They are in one way and they're not in another. And he said things about, oh, uh, penicillin and sulfonamides and, and heart transplants and things like pills for women, though we hadn't got the pill then. But, you know, things that seem all right, and they're wonder drugs or wonder gases or wonder something or other, and then there's something about them that makes them go wrong, as well as right, and then you wish they weren't there and had never been thought of. Well, that's the sort of thing that he seemed to be trying to get over to me. It was all rather difficult to understand. I said... Do you mean you don't like to take the risk? And he said, You're quite right. I don't like to take the risk. That's the trouble, because, you see, I don't know in the least what the risk will be. That's what happens to us poor devils of scientists. We take the risks, and the risks are not in what we've discovered. 
It's the risks of what the people we'll have to tell about it will do with what we've discovered. I said, now you're talking about nuclear weapons again and atom bombs. And he said, oh, to hell with nuclear weapons and atom bombs. We've gone far beyond that. But if you're going to make people nice-tempered and benevolent, I said, what have you got to worry about? And he said, you don't understand, Matilda. You'll never understand. My fellow scientists in all probability would not understand either. And no politicians would ever understand. And so, you see, it's too big a risk to be taken. At any rate, one would have to think for a long time. But, I said, you could bring people out of it again, just like laughing gas, couldn't you? I mean, you could make people benevolent just for a short time, and then they'd get all right again or all wrong again. It depends which way you look at it, I should have thought. And he said, no, this will be, you see, permanent, quite permanent, because it affects the, um, oh, and then he went into jargon again, you know, long words and numbers, formulas, or molecular changes, something like that. I expect, really, it must be something like what they do to cretins, you know, to make them stop being cretins, like giving them thyroid or taking it away from them. I forget which it is. Something like that. Well, I expect there's some nice little gland somewhere, and if you take it away or smoke it out or do something drastic to it, but then people are permanently, permanently benevolent. You're sure that's the right word? Benevolence? Yes, because that's why he nicknamed it Benvo. But what did his colleagues think, I wonder, about his backing out? I don't think he had many who knew. Lisa, what's her name, the Austrian girl, she'd worked on it with him, and there was one young man called uh, Ledenthal, or something like that, but he died of tuberculosis. And he rather spoke as though the other people who worked with him were merely assistants, who didn't know exactly what he was doing or trying for. I see what you're getting at, said Matilda suddenly. I don't think he ever told anybody, really. I mean, I think he destroyed his formulas, or notes, whatever they were, and gave up the whole idea. And then he had his stroke and got ill. And now, poor dear, he can't speak very well. He's paralyzed one side. He can hear fairly well. He listens to music. That's his whole life now. His life's work's ended, you think? He doesn't even see his friends. I think it's painful to him to see them. He always makes some excuse. But he's alive, said Admiral Blunt. He's alive still. Got his address? It's in my address book somewhere. He's still in the same place. North Scotland somewhere. But, oh, do understand, he was such a wonderful man once. He isn't now. He's just almost dead, for all intents and purposes. There's always hope, said Admiral Blunt. And belief, he added. Faith. And benevolence, I suppose, said Lady Matilda. Chapter 21 Project Benvo Professor John Gottlieb sat in his chair looking very steadfastly at the handsome young woman sitting opposite him. He scratched his ear with a rather monkey-like gesture which was characteristic of him. He looked rather like a monkey anyway, a prognathous jaw, a high mathematical head which made a slight contrast in terms, and a small wizened frame. It's not every day, said Professor Gottlieb, that a young lady brings me a letter from the President of the United States. However, he said cheerfully, presidents don't always know exactly what they're doing. What's this all about? I gather you're vouched for on the highest authority. I've come to ask you what you know or what you can tell me about something called Project Benvo. Are you really Countess Renata Zakowski? Technically, possibly, I am. I am more often known as Mary Ann. Yes, that's what they wrote me under separate cover. And you want to know about Project Benvo? Well, uh, there was such a thing. Now it's dead and buried, and the man who thought of it also, I expect. You mean Professor Shoreham? That's right, Robert Shoreham, one of the greatest geniuses of our age. Einstein, Niels Bohr, and some others, but Robert Shoreham didn't last as long as he should. A great loss to science. What is it Shakespeare says of Lady Macbeth? She should have died hereafter. He's not dead, said Marianne. Oh, sure of that? Nothing's been heard of him for a long time. He's an invalid. He lives in the north of Scotland. He is paralyzed, can't speak very well, can't walk very well. He sits most of the time listening to music. Yes, I can imagine that. Well, I'm glad about that. If he can do that, he won't be too unhappy. Otherwise, it's a pretty fair hell for a brilliant man who isn't brilliant any more. 
who is, as it were, dead in an invalid chair. There was such a thing as Project Benvo? Yes, he was very keen about it. He talked to you about it? He talked to some of us about it in the early days. You're not a scientist yourself, young woman, I suppose? No, I'm... You're just an agent, I suppose. I hope you're on the right side. We still have to hope for miracles these days, but I don't think you'll get anything out of Project Benvo. Why not? You said he worked on it. It would have been a very great invention, wouldn't it? Or discovery, or whatever you call these things. Yes, it would have been one of the greatest discoveries of the age. I don't know just what went wrong. It's happened before now. A thing goes along all right, but in the last stages, somehow, it doesn't click, breaks down, doesn't do what's expected of it, and you give up in despair, or else you do what Shoreham did. What was that? He destroyed it. Every damn bit of it. He told me so himself. Burnt all the formulas, all the papers concerning it, all the data. Three weeks later, he had his stroke. I'm sorry, you see, I can't help you. I never knew any details about it, nothing but its main idea. I don't even remember that now, except for one thing. Benvo stood for benevolence. Chapter 22 Juanita Lord Altamount was dictating. The voice that had once been ringing and dominant was now reduced to a gentleness that had still an unexpectedly special appeal. It seemed to come gently out of the shadows of the past, but to be emotionally moving in a way that a more dominant tone would not have been. James Cleek was taking down the words as they came, pausing every now and then when a moment of hesitation came, allowing for it, and waiting gently himself. Idealism, said Lord Altamont, can arise, and indeed usually does so, when moved by a natural antagonism to injustice. That is a natural revulsion from crass materialism. The natural idealism of youth is fed more and more by a desire to destroy those two phases of modern life, injustice and crass materialism. That desire to destroy what is evil sometimes leads to a love of destruction for its own sake. It can lead to a pleasure in violence and in the infliction of pain. All this can be fostered and strengthened from outside by those who are gifted by a natural power of leadership. This original idealism arises in a non-adult stage. It should and could lead on to a desire for a new world. It should lead also towards a love of all human beings and of goodwill towards them. But those who have once learned to love violence for its own sake will never become adult. They will be fixed in their own retarded development, and will so remain for their lifetime. The buzzer went. Lord Altamount gestured, and James Cleek lifted it up and listened. A uh, Mr. Robinson is here. Ah, yes. Bring him in. We can go on with this later. James Cleek rose, laying aside his notebook and pencil. Mr. Robinson came in. James Cleek set a chair for him one sufficiently widely proportioned to receive his form without discomfort. Mr. Robinson smiled his thanks, and arranged himself by Lord Altamont's side. Well, said Lord Altamont, got anything new for us? Diagrams? Circles? Bubbles? He seemed faintly amused. Uh, not exactly, said Mr. Robinson imperturbably. It's more like plotting the course of a river. A river? said Lord Altamont. What sort of river? A river of money, said Mr. Robinson, in the slightly apologetic voice he was wont to use when referring to his speciality. It's really just like a river money is, coming from somewhere and definitely going to somewhere. Really very interesting, that is, if you are interested in these things. It tells its own story. You see, James Cleek looked as though he didn't see. But Altamont said, I understand. Go on. It's flowing from Scandinavia, from Bavaria, from the USA, from Southeast Asia, fed by lesser tributaries on the way. And going where? 
mainly to South America, meeting the demands of the now securely established headquarters of military youth, and representing four of the five intertwined circles you showed us, armaments, drugs, scientific and chemical warfare missiles, as well as finance. Yes, we think we know now fairly accurately who controls these various groups. What about Circle J, Juanita? asked James Cleek. As yet we cannot be sure. James has certain ideas as to that, said Lord Altamont. I hope he may be wrong. Yes, I hope so. The initial J is interesting. What does it stand for? Justice? Judgment? A dedicated killer, said James Cleek. The female of the species is more deadly than the male. There are historical precedents, admitted Altamount. Jail, setting butter in a lordly dish before Sisera, and afterwards driving the nail through his head. Judith, executing Holofernes, and applauded for it by her countrymen. Yes, you may have something there. So you think you know who Juanita is, do you? said Mr. Robinson. That's interesting. Well, uh, perhaps I'm wrong, sir, but there have been things that have made me think. Yes, said Mr. Robinson. We have all had to think, haven't we? Better say who you think it is, James. The Countess Renata Zakowski. What makes you pitch upon her? The places she's been, the people she's been in contact with. There's been too much coincidence about the way she's been turning up in different places and all that. She's been in Bavaria, she's been visiting Big Charlotte there. What's more, she took Stafford Nye with her. I think that's significant. You think they're in this together? asked Altamont. I wouldn't like to say that. I don't know enough about him. But— he paused. Yes, said Lord Altamont. There have been doubts about him. He was suspected from the beginning. By Henry Horsham. Henry Horsham, for one, perhaps— Colonel Pikeaway isn't sure, I imagine. He's been under observation. Probably knows it, too. He's not a fool. Another of them, said James Cleek savagely. Extraordinary. How we can breed them, how we can trust them, tell them our secrets, let them know what we're doing, go on saying, if there's one person I'm absolutely sure of, it's, oh, McLean or Burgess or Philby or any of the lot, and now Stafford Nye. Stafford Nye, indoctrinated by Renata. Alias Juanita, said Mr. Robinson. There was that curious business at Frankfurt Airport, said Cleek. And there was the visit to Charlotte. Stafford and I, I gather, has since been in South America with her. As for she herself, do we know where she is now? I dare say Mr. Robinson does, said Lord Altamont. Do you, Mr. Robinson? She's in the United States. I've heard that after staying with friends in Washington or near it, she was in Chicago then in California, and that she went from Austin to visit a top-flight scientist. That's the last I've heard. What's she doing there? One would presume, said Mr. Robinson in his calm voice, that she is trying to obtain information. What information? Mr. Robinson sighed. That is what one wishes one knew. One presumes that it is the same information that we are anxious to obtain, and that she is doing it on our behalf. But one never knows. It may be for the other side. He turned to look at Lord Altamount. Tonight, I understand, you are travelling to Scotland. Is that right? Quite right. I don't think he ought to, sir, said James Cleek. He turned an anxious face to his employer. You've not been so well lately, sir. It'll be a very tiring journey, whichever way you go, air or train. Can't you leave it to Monroe and Horsham? At my age, it's a waste of time to take care, said Lord Altamont. If I can be useful, I would like to die in harness, as the saying goes. He smiled at Mr. Robinson. You'd better come with us, Robinson. Chapter 23 Journey to Scotland The squadron leader wondered a little what it was all about. He was accustomed to being left only partly in the picture. That was security's doing, he supposed, taking no chances. He'd done this sort of thing before, more than once, flying a plane of people out to an unlikely spot with unlikely passengers, being careful to ask no questions except such as were of an entirely factual nature. 
He knew some of his passengers on this flight, but not all of them. Lord Altamount he recognized. An ill man. A very sick man, he thought. A man who he judged kept himself alive by sheer willpower. The keen, hawk-faced man with him was his special guard-dog, presumably, seeing not so much to his safety as to his welfare. A faithful dog who never left his side. He would have with him restoratives, stimulants, all the medical box of tricks. The squadron leader wondered why there wasn't a doctor also in attendance. It would have been an extra precaution. Like a death's head, the old man looked. A noble death's head. Something made of marble in a museum. Henry Horsham, the squadron leader, knew quite well. He knew several of the security lot. And Colonel Munro, looking slightly less fierce than usual, rather more worried. Not very happy on the whole. There was also a large, yellow-faced man, foreigner he might be. Asiatic? What was he doing, flying in a plane to the north of Scotland? The squadron leader said deferentially to Colonel Munro, Everything laid on, sir. The car is here waiting. How far, actually, is the distance? A seventeen miles, sir. Roughish road, but not too bad. There are extra rugs in the car. Uh, you have your orders. Repeat, please, if you will, squadron leader Andrews. The squadron leader repeated, and the colonel nodded satisfaction. As the car finally drove off, the squadron leader looked after it, wondering to himself why on earth those particular people were here on this drive over the lonely moor to a venerable old castle where a sick man lived as a recluse without friends or visitors in the general run of things. Horsham knew, he supposed. Horsham must know a lot of strange things. Oh, well, Horsham wasn't likely to tell him anything. The car was well and carefully driven. It drew up at last over a gravel driveway and came to a stop before the porch. It was a turreted building of heavy stone. Lights hung at either side of the big door. The door itself opened before there was any need to ring a bell or demand admittance. An old Scottish woman of sixty-odd with a stern, dour face stood in the doorway. The chauffeur helped the occupants out. James Cleek and Horsham helped Lord Altamount to alight and supported him up the steps. The old Scottish woman stood aside and dropped a respectful curtsy to him. She said, "'Good evening, your lordship. The master's waiting for you. He knows you're arriving. We've got rooms prepared and fires for you in all of them.' Another figure had arrived in the hall now. A tall, lean woman between fifty and sixty, a woman who was still handsome. Her black hair was parted in the middle. She had a high forehead, an aquiline nose, and tanned skin. "'Here's Miss Newman to look after you.' said the Scottish woman. Thank you, Janet, said Miss Newman. Be sure the fires are kept up in the bedrooms. I will that. Lord Altamount shook hands with her. A good evening, Miss Newman. A good evening, Lord Altamount. I hope you are not too tired by your journey. Uh, we had a very good flight. Uh, this is Colonel Munro, Miss Newman. Uh, this is Mr. Robinson, uh, Sir James Cleek, and Mr. Horsham, of the security department. I remember Mr. Horsham from some years ago, I think. I hadn't forgotten, said Henry Horsham. It was at the Leveson Foundation. You were already, I think, Professor Shoreham's secretary at that time. I was first his assistant in the laboratory, and afterwards his secretary. I am still, as far as he needs one, his secretary. He also has to have a hospital nurse living here, more or less permanently. There have to be changes from time to time. Miss Ellis, who is here now, took over from Miss Bude only two days ago. I have suggested that she should stay near at hand to the room in which we ourselves shall be. I thought you would prefer privacy, but uh, that she ought not to be out of call in case she was needed. Is he in very bad health? asked Colonel Munro. He doesn't actually suffer, said Miss Newman. But you must prepare yourself, if you have not seen him, that is, for a long time. He is only a what is left of a man. Uh, just one moment before you take us to him. His mental processes are not too badly depleted. He can understand what one says to him. Oh, yes, he can understand perfectly. But as he is semi-paralyzed, he is unable to speak with much clarity, though that varies, and is unable to walk without help. His brain, in my opinion, is as good as it ever was. The only difference is that he tires very easily now. Now, would you like some refreshment first? No, said Lord Altamount, 
No, I, I don't want to wait. This is a rather urgent matter on which we have come, so if you will take us to him now. He expects us, I understand? He expects you, yes, said Lisa Newman. She led the way up some stairs, along a corridor, and opened a room of medium size. It had tapestries on the wall. The heads of stags looked down on them. The place had been a one-time shooting box. It had been little changed in its furnishings or arrangements. There was a big record player on one side of the room. The tall man sat in a chair by the fire. His head trembled a little. So did his left hand. The skin of his face was pulled down one side. Without beating about the bush, one could only describe him one way. As a wreck of a man. A man who had once been tall, sturdy, strong. He had a fine forehead, deep-set eyes, and a rugged, determined-looking chin. The eyes below the heavy brows were intelligent. He said something. His voice was not weak. It made fairly clear sounds, but not always recognizable ones. The faculty of speech had only partly gone from him. He was still understandable. Lisa Newman went to stand by him, watching his lips so that she could interpret what he said if necessary. A Professor Shoreham welcomes you. He is very pleased to see you here, Lord Altamount, Colonel Monroe, Sir James Cleek, Mr. Robinson, and Mr. Horsham. He would like me to tell you that his hearing is reasonably good. Anything you say to him, he will be able to hear. If there is any difficulty, I can assist. What he wants to say to you, he will be able to transmit through me. If he gets too tired to articulate, I can lip-read, and we also converse in a perfected sign language, if there is any difficulty. I shall try, said Colonel Monroe, not to waste your time and to tie you as little as possible, Professor Shoreham. The man in the chair bent his head in recognition of the words. Some questions I can ask of Miss Newman. Shoreham's hand went out in a faint gesture towards the woman standing by his side. Sounds came from his lips, again not quite recognizable to them, but she translated quickly. He says he can depend on me to transcribe anything you wish to say to him or I to you. You have, I think, already received a letter from me, said Colonel Munro. That is so, said Miss Newman. Professor Shoreham received your letter and knows its contents. A hospital nurse opened the door just a crack, but she did not come in. She spoke in a low whisper. Is there anything I can get or do, Miss Newman, for any of the guests, or for Professor Shoreham? I don't think there is anything, thank you, Miss Ellis. I should be glad, though, if you could stay in your sitting-room, just along the passage, in case we should need anything. Certainly. I quite understand. She went away, closing the door softly. Uh, we don't want to lose time, said Colonel Munro, and no doubt Professor Shoreham is in tune with current affairs. Entirely so, said Miss Newman, as far as he is interested. Does he keep in touch with scientific advancements and such things? Robert Shoreham's head shook slightly from side to side. He himself answered, I have finished with all that. But you know roughly the state the world is in. The success of what is called the Revolution of Youth, the seizing of power by youthful, fully equipped forces. Miss Newman said, He is in touch entirely with everything that is going on, in a political sense, that is. The world is now given over to violence, pain, revolutionary tenets, a strange and incredible philosophy of rule by an anarchic minority. A faint look of impatience went across the gaunt face. Uh, he knows all that said Mr. Robinson, speaking unexpectedly. No need to go over a lot of things again. He's a man who knows everything. He said, Do you remember Admiral Blunt? Again the head bowed. Something like a smile showed on the twisted lips. Admiral Blunt remembers some scientific work you had done on a certain project. I think project is what you call these things. Project Benvo. They saw the alert look which came into the eyes. A Project Benvo, said Miss Newman. You're going back quite a long time, Mr. Robinson, to recall that. It was your project, wasn't it? said Mr. Robinson. Yes, it was his project. Miss Newman now spoke more easily for him as a matter of course. We cannot use nuclear weapons. We cannot use explosives or gas or chemistry. 
But your Project Benvo we could use. There was a silence, and nobody spoke. And then again the queer, distorted sounds came from Professor Shoreham's lips. He says, of course, said Miss Newman. Benvo could be used successfully in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. The man in the chair had turned to her and was saying something to her. He wants me to explain it to you, said Miss Newman. Project B, later called Project Benvo, was something that he worked upon for many years, but which at last he laid aside for reasons of his own. Because he had failed to make his project materialize. Uh, no, he had not failed, said Lisa Newman. We had not failed. I worked with him on this project. He laid it aside for certain reasons, but he did not fail. He succeeded. He was on the right track. He developed it. He tested it in various laboratory experiments, and it worked. She turned to Professor Shoreham again, made a few gestures with her hand touching her lips, ear, mouth, in a strange kind of code signal. I am asking if he wants me to explain just what Benvo does. We do want you to explain. And he wants to know how you learnt about it. Uh, we learnt about it, said Colonel Munro, through an old friend of yours, Professor Shoreham, not Admiral Blunt, he could not remember very much, but the other person to whom you had once spoken about it, Lady Matilda Cleckheaton. Again Miss Newman turned to him and watched his lips. She smiled faintly. He says he thought Matilda was dead years ago. Uh, she is very much alive. It is she who wanted us to know about this discovery of Professor Shoreham's. Professor Shoreham will tell you the main points of what you want to know, though he has to warn you that this knowledge will be quite useless to you. Papers, formulae, accounts and proofs of this discovery were all destroyed. But since the only way to satisfy your questions is for you to learn the main outline of Project Benvo, I can tell you fairly clearly of what it consists. You know the uses and purposes of tear gas as used by the police in controlling riot crowds, violent demonstrations, and so on. It induces a fit of weeping, painful tears, and sinus inflammation. And this is something of that kind? No. It is not in the least of that kind, but it can have the same purpose. It came into the heads of scientists that one can change not only men's principal reactions and feeling, but also mental characteristics. You can change a man's character. The qualities of an aphrodisiac are well known. They lead to a condition of sexual desire. There are various drugs or gases or glandular operations. Any of these things can lead to a change in your mental vigor, increased energy, as by alterations to the thyroid gland. And Professor Shoreham wishes to tell you that there is a certain process. He will not tell you now whether it is glandular or a gas that can be manufactured, but there is something that can change a man in his outlook on life, his reaction to people and to life generally. He may be in a state of homicidal fury. He may be pathologically violent, and yet by the influence of Project Benvo, he turns into something, or rather someone, quite different. He becomes, there is only one word for it, I believe, which is embodied in its name, he becomes benevolent. He wishes to benefit others. He exudes kindness. He has a horror of causing pain or inflicting violence. Benvo can be released over a big area. It can affect hundreds, thousands of people if manufactured in big enough quantities and if distributed successfully. How long does it last? said Colonel Munro. Twenty-four hours? Longer? You don't understand, said Miss Newman. It is permanent. Permanent? You've changed a man's nature, you've altered a component, a physical component, of course, of his being, which has produced the effect of a permanent change in his nature. And you cannot go back on that? You cannot put him back to where he was again? It has to be accepted as a permanent change? Yes. It was, perhaps, a discovery more of medical interest at first, but Professor Shoreham had conceived of it as a deterrent to be used in war, in mass risings, riotings, revolutions, anarchy. He didn't think of it as merely medical. It does not produce happiness in the subject, only a great wish for others to be happy. That is an effect, he says, that everyone feels in their life at one time or another. They have a great wish to make someone, one person or many people, to make them comfortable, 
happy, in good health, all these things. And since people can and do feel these things, there is, we both believed, a component that controls that desire in their bodies. And if you once put that component in operation, it can go on in perpetuity. Wonderful, said Mr. Robinson. He spoke thoughtfully, rather than enthusiastically. Wonderful! What a thing to have discovered! What a thing to be able to put into action, if— But why? The head resting towards the back of the chair turned slowly towards Mr. Robinson. Miss Newman said, He says you understand better than the others. But it's the answer, said James Cleek. It's the exact answer! It's wonderful! His face was enthusiastically excited. Miss Newman was shaking her head. Project Benvo, she said, is not for sale and not for a gift. It has been relinquished. Are you telling us the answer is no? said Colonel Munro incredulously. Yes. Professor Shoreham says the answer is no. He decided that it was against— She paused a minute and turned to look at the man in the chair— he made quaint gestures with his head with one hand, and a few guttural sounds came from his mouth. She waited, and then she said, He will tell you himself. He was afraid, afraid of what science has done in its time of triumph. The things it has found out and known, the things it has discovered and given to the world, the wonder drugs that have not always been wonder drugs, the penicillin that has saved lives and the penicillin that has taken lives the heart transplants that have brought disillusion and the disappointment of a death not expected. He has lived in the period of nuclear fission, new weapons that have slain, the tragedies of radioactivity, the pollutions that new industrial discoveries have brought about. He has been afraid of what science could do, used indiscriminately. But this is a benefit, a benefit to everyone, cried Monroe. So have many things been, always greeted as great benefits to humanity, as great wonders. And then come the side effects, and worse than that, the fact that they have sometimes brought not benefit but disaster. And so he decided that he would give up. He says, she read from a paper she held, whilst beside her he nodded agreement from his chair, I am satisfied that I have done what I set out to do, that I made my discovery, but I decided not to put it into circulation. It must be destroyed. And so it has been destroyed. And so the answer to you is no. There is no benevolence on tap. There could have been, once, but now all the formulae, all the know-how, my notes and my account of the necessary procedure, are gone, burnt to ashes. I have destroyed my brainchild. Robert Shoreham struggled into raucous, difficult speech. I... Have destroyed my brain, child, and nobody in the world knows how I arrived at it. One man helped me, but he is dead. He died of tuberculosis a year after we had come to success. You must go away again. I cannot help you. But this knowledge of yours means you could save the world. The man in the chair made a curious noise. It was laughter, the laughter of a crippled man. <laughs> Save the world! Save the world! What a phrase! That's what your young people are doing, they think. They're going ahead in violence and hatred to save the world. But they don't know how. They will have to do it themselves, out of their own hearts, out of their own minds. We can't give them an artificial way of doing it. No, an artificial goodness, an artificial kindness, none of that. It wouldn't be real. It wouldn't mean anything. It would be against nature, he said slowly. Against God. The last two words came out unexpectedly, clearly enunciated. He looked round at his listeners. It was as though he pleaded with them for understanding, yet at the same time had no real hope of it. I had a, a right to destroy what I had created. 
I doubt it very much, said Mr. Robinson. Knowledge is knowledge. What you have given birth to, what you have made come to life, you should not destroy. You have a right to your opinion, but the fact you will have to accept. No! Mr. Robinson brought the word out with force. Lisa Newman turned on him angrily. What do you mean by no? Her eyes were flashing. A handsome woman, Mr. Robinson thought. A woman who had been in love with Robert Shoreham, all her life probably. Had loved him, worked with him, and now lived beside him, ministering to him with her intellect, giving him devotion in its purest form, without pity. There are things one gets to know in the course of one's lifetime said Mr. Robinson. I don't suppose mine will be a long life. I carry too much weight to begin with. He sighed as he looked down at his bulk. But I do know some things. I'm right, you know, Shoreham. You'll have to admit I'm right, too. You're an honest man. You wouldn't have destroyed your work. You couldn't have brought yourself to do it. You've got it somewhere still, locked away, hidden away. Not in this house, probably. I'd guess, and I'm only making a guess that you've got it somewhere in a safe deposit or a bank. She knows you've got it there, too. You trust her. She's the only person in the world you do trust, Shoreham said, and this time his voice was almost distinct. Who are you? Who the devil are you? I'm just a man who knows about money, said Mr. Robinson and the things that branch off from money, you know? People and their idiosyncrasies and their practices in life. If you liked to, you could lay your hand on the work that you've put away. I'm not saying that you could do the same work now, but I think it's all there somewhere. You've told us your views, and I wouldn't say they were all wrong, said Mr. Robinson. Possibly you're right. Benefits to humanity are tricky things to deal with. Poor old beverage. Freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom from whatever it was. He thought he was making a heaven on earth by saying that and planning for it and getting it done. But it hasn't made a heaven on earth, and I don't suppose your Benvo, or whatever you call it, sounds like a patent food, will bring heaven on earth either. Benevolence has its dangers, just like everything else. What it will do is save a lot of suffering. Pain, anarchy, violence, slavery to drugs. Yes, it'll save quite a lot of bad things from happening, and it might save something that was important. It might, just might, make a difference to people, young people. This Benvolio of yours, now I've made it sound like a patent cleaner, is going to make people benevolent, and I'll admit perhaps that it's going to make them condescending, smug, and pleased with themselves. But there's just a chance, too, that if you change people's natures by force, and they have to go on using that particular kind of nature until they die, one or two of them, not many, might discover that they had a natural vocation in humility, not pride, for what they were being forced to do. Really change themselves, I mean, before they died, not just be able to get out of a new habit they'd learnt. Colonel Monroe said, I don't understand what the hell you're all talking about. Miss Newman said, He's talking nonsense. You have to take Professor Shoreham's answer. He will do what he likes with his own discoveries. You can't coerce him. No, said Lord Altamount. We're not going to coerce you or torture you, Robert, or force you to reveal your hiding places. You'll do what you think right. That's agreed. Edward, said Robert Shoreham. His speech failed him slightly again, his hands moved in gesture, and Miss Newman translated quickly. Edward, he says, you are Edward Altamount. Shoreham spoke again, and she took the words from him. He asks you, Lord Altamount, if you are definitely with your whole heart and mind, asking him to put Project Benvo in your jurisdiction. He says, she paused, watching, listening, he says, you are the only man in public life that he ever trusted, if it is your wish. James Cleek was suddenly on his feet, anxious, quick to move like lightning. He stood by Lord Altamont's chair. Let me help you, sir. 
You're ill. You're not well. Please stand back a little, Miss Newman. I, I, I must get to him. I, I have his remedies here. I know what to do. His hand went into his pocket, and he came out again with a hypodermic syringe. Unless he gets this at once, it'll be too late. He had caught up Lord Altamont's arm, rolling up his sleeve, pinching the flesh between his fingers. He held the hypodermic ready, but someone else moved. Horsham was across the room, pushing Colonel Monroe aside. His hand closed over James Cleek's as he wrenched the hypodermic away. Cleek struggled, but Horsham was too strong for him, and Monroe was now there too. So it's been you, James Cleek, he said. You who've been the traitor, a faithful disciple, who wasn't a faithful disciple. Miss Newman had gone to the door, had flung it open, and was calling, Nurse! Come quickly! Nurse! The nurse appeared. She gave one quick glance to Professor Shoreham, but he waved her away and pointed across the room to where Horsham and Monroe still held a struggling clique. Her hand went into the pocket of her uniform. Shoreham stammered out, <laughs> It's Altamont! A heart attack! Heart attack my foot, roared Monroe. It's attempted murder! He stopped. Hold the chap, he said to Horsham, and leapt across the room. Mrs. Courtman, since when have you entered the nursing profession? We'd rather lost sight of you since you gave us the slip in Baltimore. Millie Jean was still wrestling with her pocket. Now her hand came out with a small automatic pistol in it. She glanced towards Shoreham, but Monroe blocked her, and Lisa Newman was standing in front of Shoreham's chair. James Cleek yelled, Get Altamount, Juanita! Quick! Get Altamount! Her arm flashed up and she fired. James Cleek said, Damn good shot! Lord Altamount had had a classical education. He murmured faintly, looking at James Cleek, Jamie, et tu, Brute, and collapsed against the back of his chair. Dr. McCulloch looked round him, a little uncertain of what he was going to do or say next. The evening had been a somewhat unusual experience for him. Lisa Newman came to him and set a glass by his side. A hot toddy, she said. I always knew you were a woman in a thousand, Lisa. He sipped appreciatively. I must say, I'd like to know what all this has been about, but I gather it's the sort of thing that's so hush-hush that nobody's going to tell me anything. The Professor, he's all right, isn't he? The Professor? He looked at her anxious face kindly. Oh, he's fine. If you ask me, it's done him a world of good. I, I thought perhaps the shock— I'm quite all right, said Shoreham. Shock treatment is— what I needed, I... I feel... how shall I put it? Alive again. He looked surprised. McCulloch said to Lisa, Notice how much stronger his voice is. It's apathy, really, that's the enemy in these cases. What he wants is to work again. The stimulation of some brain work. Music is all very well. It's kept him soothed and able to enjoy life in a mild way. But he's really a man of great intellectual power and he misses the mental activity that was the essence of life to him. Get him started on it again, if you can. He nodded encouragingly at her, as she looked doubtfully at him. I think, Dr. McCulloch, said Colonel Monroe, that we owe you a few explanations of what happened this evening, even though, as you surmise, the powers that be will demand a hush-hush policy. Lord Altamont's death, he hesitated. Ah, the bullet didn't actually kill him, said the doctor. Death was due to shock. That hypodermic would have done the trick. Strychnine. Uh, the young man— I only just got it away from him in time, said Horsham. Been the fly in the ointment all along? asked the doctor. Yes, regarded with trust and affection for over seven years. The son of one of Lord Altamont's oldest friends. Uh, it happens. And the lady. In it together, do I understand? Yes, she got the post here by false credentials. She is also wanted by the police for murder. Murder? Yes, murder of her husband, Sam Courtman, the American ambassador. She shot him on the steps of the embassy, and told a fine tale of masked young men attacking him. Why did she have it in for him? Political or personal? He found out about some of her activities, we think. I'd say he suspected infidelity, said Horsham. Instead, he discovered a hornet's nest of espionage and conspiracy, and his wife running the show. He didn't know quite how to deal with it. Nice chap, but slow thinking. 
and she had the sense to act quickly. Wonderful how she registered grief at the memorial service. Memorial? said Professor Shoreham. Everyone, slightly startled, turned round to look at him. Difficult word to say, memorial. But I mean it. Lisa, you and I are going to have to start work again. But Robert, I'm alive again. Ask the doctor if I ought to take things easy. Lisa turned her eyes inquiringly on McCulloch. If you do, you'll shorten your life and sink back into apathy. There you are, said Shoreham. Fesh, fashion, medical fashion today. Make everyone, even if they're at death's door, go on working. Dr. McCulloch laughed and got up. <laughs> Not far wrong. I'll send you some pills along to help. I shan't take them. You'll do. At the door, the doctor paused. I just want to know, uh, how did you get the police along so quickly? Squadron leader Andrews, said Monroe, had it all in hand, arrived on the dot. We knew the woman was around somewhere, but had no idea she was in the house already. Well, I'll be off. Is all you've told me true? Feel I shall wake up any minute, having dropped off to sleep halfway through the latest thriller. Spies, murders, traitors, espionage, scientists. He went out. There was a silence. Professor Shoreham said slowly and carefully, Back to work. Lisa said, as women have always said, You must be careful, Robert. No, not careful. Time might be short. He said again, Memorial. What do you mean? You said it before. Memorial? Yes, to Edward. His memorial. Always used to think he had the face of a martyr. Joram seemed lost in thought. I'd like to get hold of Gottlieb. Maybe dead. Good man to work with. With him and with you, Lisa? Get the stuff out of the bank. Professor Gottlieb is alive. In the Baker Foundation, Austin, Texas, said Mr. Robinson. What are you talking of doing? said Lisa. Benvo, of course. Memorial to Edward Altamont. He died for it, didn't he? Nobody should die in vain. Epilogue Sir Stafford Nye wrote out a telegraph message for the third time. Have arranged for marriage ceremony to be performed on Thursday of next week at St. Christopher's in the Vale of Lower Staunton, 2.30 p.m. Stop. Ordinary Church of England service. If R.C. or Greek Orthodox desired, please wire instructions. Stop. Where are you, and what name do you wish to use for marriage ceremony? Stop. Naughty niece of mine, five years old and highly disobedient, wishes to attend as bridesmaid. Rather sweet, really. Name of Sybil. Stop. Local honeymoon, as I think we have travelled enough lately. Stop. Signed, Passenger to Frankfurt. To Stafford Nye. Accept Sybil as bridesmaid. Suggest Great Aunt Matilda as matron of honour. Stop. Also accept proposal of marriage, though not officially made. Stop. C of E quite satisfactory. Also honeymoon arrangements. Stop. Insist Panda should also be present. Stop. No good saying where I am, as I shan't be when this reaches you. Stop. Signed, Mary Ann. Do I look all right? asked Stafford Nye nervously, twisting his head to look in the glass. He was having a dress rehearsal of his wedding clothes. No worse than any other bridegroom, said Lady Matilda. They're always nervous, not like brides, who are usually quite blatantly exultant. Suppose she doesn't come. Oh, she'll come. I feel... I feel rather queer inside. Well, that's because you would have a second helping of pâté de foie gras. You've just got bridegroom's nerves. Don't fuss so much, Staffy. You'll be quite all right on the night. I mean, you'll be all right when you get to the church. Oh, that, that reminds me. You haven't forgotten to buy the ring. No, no, it's just I forgot to tell you that I've got a present for you, Aunt Matilda. Oh, that's very really nice of you, dear boy. You said the organist had gone. 
Yes, thank goodness. I've brought you a new organist. Really, Staffy? What an extraordinary idea. Where did you get him? Bavaria. He sings like an angel. But we don't need him to sing. He'll have to play the organ. Oh, he can do that, too. He's a very talented musician. Well, why does he want to leave Bavaria and come to England? His mother died. Oh, dear. That's what happened to our organist. Organists' mothers seem to be very delicate. Will he require mothering? I'm not very good at it. I dare say some grandmothering or great-grandmothering would do. The door was suddenly flung open, and an angelic-looking child in pink pyjamas, powdered with rosebuds, made a dramatic entrance, and said, in dulcet tones, as of one expecting a rapturous welcome, It's me. Sybil, why aren't you in bed? Things aren't very pleasant in the nursery. That means you've been a naughty girl, and Nanny isn't pleased with you. What did you do? Sybil looked at the ceiling and began to giggle. It was a caterpillar, a furry one. I put it on her, and it went down here. Sybil's finger indicated a spot in the middle of her chest, which, in dressmaking parlance, is referred to as the cleavage. I don't wonder Nanny was cross, Ugh, said Lady Matilda. Nanny entered at this moment, said that Miss Sybil was overexcited, wouldn't say her prayers, and wouldn't go to bed. Sybil crept to Lady Matilda's side. I want to say my prayers with you, Tilda. Very well, but then you go straight to bed. Oh, yes, Tilda. Sybil dropped on her knees, clasped her hands, and uttered various peculiar noises, which seemed to be a necessary preliminary to approaching the Almighty in prayer. She sighed, groaned, grunted, gave a final catarrhal snort, and launched herself. Please, God, bless Daddy and Mummy in Singapore, and Aunt Tilda, and Uncle Staffy, and Amy, and Cook, and Ellen, and Thomas, and all the dogs, and my pony Grizzle, and Margaret and Diana, my best friends, and Joan, the last of my friends, and make me a good girl for Jesus' sake, amen, and please God make Nanny nice. Sybil rose to her feet, exchanged glances with Nanny, and with the assurance of having won a victory, said good night and disappeared. Someone must have told her about Benvo, said Lady Matilda. By the way, Staffy, who's going to be your best man? Forgot all about it. Have I got to have one? It's usual. Sir Stafford and I picked up a small, furry animal. Panda shall be my best man. It'll please Sybil. It'll please Mary Ann. And why not? Panda's been in it from the beginning. Ever since Frankfurt. 